This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. We're back for the four o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel here on a given Friday. We have a special show today with uh, Pat Border, who is a citizen diplomat, who has uh, experted himself, may I use that term? Sure. Uh, with North Korea. Um, and it's very important we check in with him, given all the things that have happened in North Korea and with North Korea. It is the, you know, a big news item, almost as big as the president these days. And uh, we are threatened by it. We wonder what will happen over the Western horizon. Uh, Japan wonders, South Korea certainly wonders, uh, and now we have denouement, po possibly denouement. But now when we last spoke, if you remember, Pat, we did speak about this a couple times before, um, you said that you didn't think that Kim Jong-un really had a button. Does he or does he not have a button now? There's a lot more evidence that he does, and the reason I say that is because within the past several months, they have been launching Bombed, uh, they've been launching missiles, rockets, into outer space, uh, which go can go six, seven, eight hundred miles above the atmosphere, and that is a first. So that's one of the components of um, a, the uh, the bomb. Basically, yeah. the other is uh, that's a delivery system. The other is, do they have uh, either an atomic or a hydrogen bomb? And that would be judged from the tremors that reach South Korea when they do underground testing. So for the first time it appears that uh, they may have a hydrogen bomb, which is something uh, that was blown at Nagasaki and is more powerful than the atomic bomb. Yeah. Now whether they can put those two elements together is a different question, but they're a lot closer than they were eight months ago. Yeah, and we don't know exactly. I mean, I must say that with all the comments by um, you know federal agencies though they'll never be able to do it every time they said we'll never be able to, they'll never be able to do it you know north korea advanced and now here we are it's like is there a failure of intelligence here how come we didn't know how come we denied this until now we have had about four presidential administrations back to the senior bush that put it on the back burner and all the way through to junior bush and obama uh, clinton tried to deal with them uh, financially and that didn't uh, work out so uh, the answer to your question is we haven't put enough attention into it up to now so we've essentially dumped it in Trump's lap yeah well let's talk about Trump for a minute because that's really part and parcel I mean uh, people are rapidly losing confidence in him because of his style and substance I might add um, but so he gets into these ridiculous fights with Kim Jong-un which if you understand anything about the culture in, in Asia, not only North Korea, you know, talk about face, um, talk about challenging somebody, and then you wind up with an irrational reaction. He's playing with fire. He's playing with nuclear fire when he does that. Um, do you think that, you know, this is a silly question, I think. Do you think that there's a method about his madness, about Trump's madness? Do you think that potentially, I mean, does he have a plan? Uh, is there a valid strategy in what he's doing? Is, could it be that he has a method? I am not a fan of Trump's, so I'm not here to defend him. Uh, he may very well have a method, and the ongoing question from moment to moment is, is it working? Um, 25 to 30 years ago, uh, the North Koreans were announcing that they would make a lake of fire out of Seoul. So it's not as if they're responding initially for the first time to uh, tough talk, and it's not the first time uh, that the United States has engaged in tough talk on the nuclear front, although um, uh, the uh, Trump method is uh, more guttural than we have before. Let's remember back, just for a moment, uh, to 1962, to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and John Kennedy's statement in his televised address I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the quote, but he said it shall be the policy of this country to regard any attack um, launched from Cuba upon any country in our hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union upon the United States requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. That's uh, fighting words. 
that's bold. And at the time, after we got over the preliminary shock, it was taken to be genius, as it should have been, because Kennedy elevated the, um, uh, the, the situation to a, um, a genuine emergency that was worldwide in proportion. So when Trump responds uh, in kind by saying, I've got a button too, not a, not a very nuanced statement, not a very well-delivered statement, but not altogether different from the statement John Kennedy made back in October of 1962. They certainly, uh, the Koreans, certainly have not gotten a similar statement from the United States uh, from the time of uh, Bush Sr. through Obama. Mm -hmm. We have not addressed um, the, um, the North Koreans in, in, that, um, in that bold uh, a statement in that. We haven't talked to them directly. We talk about them, uh, you know, right? But okay, we haven't about actually them. asserted statements in their face this way. You're right. Uh, throughout this entire period, one of the um, not very ingenious approaches of the United States has been to talk about six-party talks in, in which we would engage along with Japan and Russia and South Korea and China. And you add those up and that's the six-party talks. Should we have done more earlier now that we're looking at it, the answer is yes. Sure. And not only is it yes, but it's probably obviously yes. But that's, that's well, not the And approach. the big question is what is earlier for this context? Because earlier could have been a long time 1980s, ago. 1980s, mm -hmm. then uh, during that period of time, um, the late 80s was a period of time when um, <clears throat> uh, Bush Sr. came into uh, the, the White House. Um, certainly, well, Bill Clinton tried, and it was worth a try one time, to deal with the nuclear issue by trading uh, heavy water reactors with light water reactors, which don't produce uh, the kind of uh, fissionable material from which a bomb could be Just made. Just for power plants, then? Well, it was, um, it was a generation of energy for North Koreans. Uh, in fact, we... Uh, Agreed to set up um, to set up a, a power plants, non-nuclear, and to provide them with fuel oil. Uh, that was never done. Well, we haven't paid attention to them, and, and meanwhile, it's festered and and passed on from generation to generation. And somehow, um, these generations of leaders have gotten the public worked up. I don't want to ask you about that, but first, you know, how what is this tough talk? What is the effect of this tough talk on, on Kim Jong-un? Is he really affected by these insults? Yeah. Or is he knows he's just playing a game? The answer is um, that the Koreans know they're just playing a game, and, but they're, they're getting pushback for the first time in over 20 years. Uh, and Trump isn't very elegant about the way he pushes back, as we know from the very many recent pronouncements which he's made. Um, and then later either denied or tried to put in a weird context of one form or another. But uh, this is the first time that they've gotten a, a sort of soldier old man kind of um, kickback from America uh, when, when, uh, when Trump says we have a bigger button. In some form or another, probably a more restrained one, that's a message that's worth repeating. This entire, the entire um, family of nations that have a bomb, and it includes some pretty weird people, um, have an understanding which we call mutually assured destruction. And basically that means that any, any country, United States included, if you're prepared to push a button, there's somebody out there that's prepared to push a button that lands a bomb on your land. And it's that mutually assured destruction which stays the hand of every country in the world. Well, unless the leader is irrational, then maybe not. And so the question I put to you is, Kim Jong-un irrational or rational? I would say he's rational. There is a uh, method in his madness, and he's not the first North Korean leader. In fact, he's the third, um, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, uh, to make similar statements and to go through what, what is really brinksmanship 
Uh, we've so, practiced. So if that's so, if that's so, mutual, you know, um, assured destruction. That's so. We don't have to worry. The U.S. does not have to worry. Hawaii doesn't have to worry about being attacked. Is that right? I would say to a degree that's true, but uh, we're tempting the fates, as we always have. From the time the first bombs were produced, we were tempting the fates, and now we have a larger community of nations that are tempting the fates. But you know, if uh, all it takes is a mistake, a bad hair day. It, it could be, in fact, one of the things uh, Kennedy talked about was uh, the possibility of a mistake causing a nuclear war. He was talking about Barbara Tuckman's book, the, 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 uh, the Guns of October. Guns of August. The Guns of August, thank you. Um, and and uh, that the idea was that all these interlocking um, uh, agreements that we had and, and uh, uh, what am I talking about, treaties with nations, so that if one nation goes to war, then it triggers another it's treaty. Program. Triggers another treaty obligation, which triggers another one. And, you and the next thing the you war. know, all of Europe is at war in World War I, even though no one intended that at the outset. They felt obligated to proceed because they had a treaty yeah. obligation with another country. It could happen again. Now, you've been to uh, North Korea a number of times. You've come on this program, talked about it a number of times, and you've been sympathetic with the people, the people of North Korea. You like them. I do. And I just wonder, you know, based on those trips and the engagement you've had with those people, how do they feel about this war of words? How do they feel about this, this brinksmanship? Excellent, excellent question on both sides of the dividing line. In August, I took my final trip in, um, in, in conformance with U.S. law, you know the uh, the Congress uh, passed a law which Trump, Trump uh, reluctantly signed, uh, which um, put North Korea off limits to Americans. That is an American law, and I have to obey it. So you can't I, go anymore. I can't go anymore unless and until uh, that that statute is um, allowed to lapse. It's, it has to be renewed every year. But if it's, if it's allowed to lapse, I could go back again. The reason that I went this time was because I wanted, while it was still lawful to do so, to see the uh, cultural icon observed by both of uh, the Koreas, which is Mount Pektu. Mount Pektu is nothing less, uh, although it's uh, portrayed as a, a very strong cultural site, it is nothing less than an active volcano and uh, once I saw it, that was the only time I needed to see it. I don't have to go back. Mm. It's a, a big, ugly. You think you'll ever have a chance to go back? To um, somewhere in North Korea, to an appropriate place, yes. And I have people there who, uh, it's surprising to me that I count as friends. On this trip, as with every trip we've taken, um, I went down to the DMZ in a small bus, and when I got to the there's a midway point where they have a coffee break stop. When I got there, um, I saw immediately my tour guide for my 2013 tour, and he recognized me just as fast. We had a nice conversation for about 10 minutes before my bus pulled out, and um, he, I, I, I said, how's your son, how old is he now? And he pulled out uh, uh, their version of, a, of, of an iPhone, and showed me the photo of his now 10-year-old son. <laughs> but he was startled that I remembered, and we both recognized each other instantly. It was a double take from the outset. We had a nice conversation, and I count him, and, and really about a half a dozen other of the people who've taken me on tours, uh, they recognize mm, us. Shows you the human there must connection. be something I'm doing which makes them recognize me in a favorable light. You are a memorable person, Pat. And, and we're going to dwell on that for one minute during a break and see, uh, see if you agree or disagree with me about that. We'll come back. And after this break, Pat, I want to talk to you about the elephant in the room, the thing we haven't touched on yet, and that is the Olympics. We'll be right back. Thank you. I'm going to the game and it's going to be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today because I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way because it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you want to be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says 
Let's go. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with uh, Pat Border, citizen journalist and diplomat who visits North Korea and opines about it and has a, a, a deep understanding and, a, and sympathy for the people in North Korea. So um, here we are, and things are tense. You'll have to agree with me. They're pretty tense. They're as tense as they've been since I've been watching this issue. Nails have been bitten. Nails have been bitten. A lot of people are talking about it, even worrying about it. Um, you know, and a lot, a lot of it has to do with confidence not only in North Korea, but also in this administration in the, in the United States. So you, you take two guys who yell at each other, and you don't know what the result is going to be. If they have a street fight, mm, you could be a victim. So, <clears throat> pretty tense, and now all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have a kind of mini conciliation. Why? What happened? This is part of North Korea's MO, their modus operandi, how they work. Um, they have been very successful with what I've called brinksmanship, and it, brinksmanship means going right up to the edge and never going over into the abyss. Uh, we tried that uh, during the beginning of the Eisenhower administration when, as the only holder of the bomb, we sort of let it be known informally in circles that if we didn't get our way, well, you, you just don't know. Then, of course, in the early 50s, the Russians uh, got both the uh, atomic and hydrogen bomb, courtesy of our spies, and uh, then it became a different game, and so uh, that receded somewhat. But from time to time, we've played brinksmanship too, so um, it gets them uh, remarkable results. Every time in one of the, now I'd say, misguided operations that take South Korean presidents up to North Korea for what, what it amounts to a glori glorified uh, guided tour of Pyongyang, <laughs> you know, so Kim Dae-jung and um, uh, No Tae-woo, or no, no, it's a president, the second president, no, are uh, very well versed in uh, the, uh, where, the wise and wherefores of the city of Pyongyang, and it is a pretty city, uh, but they have little for that otherwise and they spent hundreds of millions of dollars um, for the privilege of going there. One of the telltale features of that, uh, that uh, diplomacy, that form of diplomacy, is that the northern leaders never go south <laughs> because, because they couldn't deal with the press. Yeah. And that's basically, yeah. that's basically what goes on. But um, at the outset, when uh, the current president, um, Moon Jae-in, uh, Jae uh, was was thinking of going to uh, North Korea and using that that sunshine policy, as they call it. Um, the uh, uh, the incidents that were happening made it clear that in order to be with the program, he couldn't do that, and so he's taken a tougher line, which is not his natural politics. Uh, and he and Trump are pretty much on the same page. How about the people in South Korea? The people in South Korea are very worried about the uh, THAAD, that, that anti-missile system, because they're afraid that there may be uh, fallout from it uh, for which they would suffer. And they're also concerned that uh, it, it puts the U.S. in the position of being the decision maker, because these anti-ballistic missile systems are uh, run by Americans, they're afraid that uh, they could be sucked into uh, a war or a situation they don't want to be in. So there is a considerable well, amount worse of... worse yet, that the Americans could fail them, could fail to defend them at the critical moment. That's a possibility, but that's not what they're worried about. Uh, I, I've been there for a couple of occasions. I was there last year during the impeachment process of the 
the previous president, and they were raising the issue uh, then. There is a legitimate concern on the part of South Korea that uh, the U.S. could, in effect, take over the strategy, and they would find themselves um, simply the object of a war that's being run by the U.S., mm -hmm. just like Vietnam. That's how Vietnam yeah, sure, came about. Sure. It was run from the White House. Yeah. So let's go back to the uh, the issue of how how this uh, Olympics peace peace uh, you know initiative um, came up. Who who started it and why did they start it and why was it interesting to the other side? Well, the South Koreans wanted maximum participation, and they had the Seoul Olympics from 1988 as an example. Um, Kim Il Sung tried to share in the Olympics by suggesting to, to the Seoul Organizing Committee that some of the sporting events could be held in the North. Uh, that spawned a sort of hyper-technical uh, discussion that led to the conclusion that Olympics are awarded to cities, not countries. So Seoul had the Olympics, so they had the right of refusal, and they refused. Um, Kim did not send um, sport um, participants in 1988, but nor did he do anything to disrupt the Olympics, and they came off uh, very well, and that's what I would expect in Pyeongchang. Getting the entire world angry at you by creating uh, a dangerous incident that could um, um, injure people from all countries of the world is the last thing the North Koreans want to do. So the Pyeongchang Olympics, the Winter Games of this year, will uh, come across without incident. So why, <clears throat> why are they participating? What's in it for them? They just came off a big argument with Trump. Uh, they're still they're having in, an argument with Trump. They're in this cycle of uh, brinksmanship, which y you threaten and cajole until you get uh, mostly, usually financial concessions. And then there comes a period of a peace and almost adulation between both sides. And then after a while, they go back to being belligerent, again, usually picking some pretext for doing it. And then once they've done that, you're back in the cycle again. It's a big circle. Yeah, and so, so if, there, if, if, there's, if there really is a successful engagement here on the Olympics, we have less to worry about because they're gonna be focused on the Olympics rather than arguing with Trump. For now, you have less to worry about. And once again, um, you know, Trump has uh, had his share of missteps, but on this one, uh, this is a problem that was delivered right to his front door. I mean, fair is fair, and he finds himself in a situation that no prior president did. And so I would say, um, the fact that Trump is in the White House does not, in my estimate, increase the likelihood of something bad happening. Mm. <coughs> Calling me. him Rocket Man and um, you know, uh, confronting him, attacking him on a personal level, yeah. that's not good diplomacy no matter yeah. how you cut it. Yes, those finely nuanced statements don't add much to finely the body. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm being a little sarcastic, but yeah, it doesn't help any. No, but no. but it, it's... It's, the statements are, in a way, they're in kind. They're, he's responding to them in a way that's not altogether different from the way that they responded. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that method is, um, it's overdue, but it could be a good deal more nuanced than Trump puts it. But there's, there isn't gonna be any kind of a war, and least of all because, anything, because of anything that Trump does. Well. This is the first time uh, in over decades when we pushed back to their mm. forms of belligerence. So where <clears throat> there's not going to be a war, that's a good, that's good news, um, but w what about a peace? I mean, is this going to lead to a, a, a true denouement? Is this going to lead to uh, open border? It's going to lead to trade or the resumption of some of the economic ties that used to exist between South Korea and North Korea, which you and I have spoken about on sure. the show. Some uh, of those ties, <clears throat> the answer to your question is, some of those ties are beginning to uh, be relaxed again. The um, up at the border, um, the um, um, factories that are owned by South Koreans and worked by North Korean labor, uh, that'll begin again. And part of it will be just simply because it's a, a form of income to the North Korean government because all the, all the paychecks that are paid nominally to North Koreans are going to the government. And 
um, some of the um, uh, some of the incentives or disincentives uh, that we're uh, about to undertake um, are going to put some teeth into sanctions, which we always thought occurred, but they didn't. The coal has always been, those deals have always been struck by the, by the banks, the Chinese banks in Dandong, right across the border from Korea, which means we thought, we've always thought over this uh, period of time that uh, coal uh, would not be sold by the North Koreans to anyone, and that was a false assumption. Mm. So basically what we're dealing with is when people say sanctions don't work, the logical response to that is, well, let's try them first. Because if the Chinese are cheating, as they do routinely, then um, we're not applying sanctions mm -hmm. at all. So, you know, what, so where does it go in, in terms of, uh, well, I don't know, uh, the nuclear initiative that he's adopted? Is this going to slow him down? Is it, it part, might, part of this Olympics initiative uh, a reduction of the nuclear effort? Um, very likely not. Uh, the cooperation at the Olympics will have no effect. Exactly where North Korea is, is getting the materials to make a bomb and to make it deliver, deliverable, we don't know. But uh, we do know from, our, from just world history that uh, any country that wants a bomb badly enough will not be denied. Let's not forget that at the time our forces were going into Pakistan, to kill Osama bin Laden, Pakistan is one of the countries with a bomb. Okay, so, mm -hmm. and, and we are noting more recently that their behavior is a good deal more duplicitous than we originally thought. Mm -hmm. Now that um, Prime Minister Modi in, in uh, India is, is uh, working more toward a, um, a, a commercial, a mercantile economy, uh, we're beginning to tilt more in the direction of India and a, a, a more than a little bit away from Pakistan. Yeah, it shows. And, you know, I, I'm not one, and I don't think you are either, who would posit a great deal of faith in uh, Pakistan uh, as an ally. No. They, they're duplicitous. They hid Osama bin Laden from us for years. Let's go back, and, and we, we only have time for one more question, and that is, when the Olympics are over, <clears throat> when everything settles down and whatever happens, happens hopefully without incident, where are we going to be? Are we going to be back to a war of <clears throat> words or worse? Uh, are we going to be in, a, in an age of enlightenment? What's going to happen? Don't count on ages of enlightenment. They don't happen naturally. Um, you're going to be back to um, um, arms race and uh, the Koreans, North Koreans will be closer. The, the counterbalance against them, sadly, is going to end up being uh, nuclear power, nuclear bombs in South Korea. We used, in the 1980s, during the period of time, and in the 70s, when I was stationed in South Korea, we did have nukes on the Korean Peninsula under U.S. control, but uh, the Korean Peninsula was nuclearized and that may have to happen again uh, as a counterbalance. It's this. It's it's the uh, uh, it's the balance of terror. <clears throat> it's tragic. You know, I I heard recently that uh, that the um, North Koreans had agreed to let families continue resume meeting families, South Korean families coming to meet North Korean families. However, mm -hmm. small a trickle that may be. Um, but you know, the reality is that this is a great tragedy for the Korean people, the Korean culture. And it's, from what you say, it sounds like it's um, not going to it's not going to resolve anytime soon. It's going to remain a hot spot in the world and a rogue nation. I don't think that uh, family reunification is ever going to be as great as it once was because families are dying out. Yeah, right. Uh, the the people, the brothers and sisters who knew each other and who were tragically separated in the 1950s by the war are gone now, and their children and grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, are dealing with the matter, but yeah. it's much more, it's abstract, it's, you know, there's no one to miss if you've never met your cousin right. in the first place. Right, and I'll give you a tragic separation for us, Pat. We're about done, we run out of time. I could have gone three or four times as long as this and been overjoyed the entire time. <laughs> Pat Porter, citizen diplomat, thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. <laughs>